Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to Junior Doan's The Spark. I'm Junior Doan and thank you for joining us. Today I'm with Nick Adams, three times best-selling author and commentator. Nick is also the founder and executive director of the Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness. Welcome Nick, I'm really thrilled you're here today. It's not often I get to interview someone who was born and raised in Australia and now is American. Almost certainly, right? Junior, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. What was your early life like in Australia? Look, I've had a really interesting life. Uh, as you know, I came to the United States of America a few years ago. Uh, but before that, I was born and raised in Sydney, Australia. Uh, my life began with some pretty serious adversity. I was diagnosed at the age of 16 months with stage four neuroblastoma, which is a very rare form of childhood cancer. Beautiful. I had to undergo uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and an operation. Uh, I was given a 5% chance of life. Only one in 20 children, babies, infants with stage four neuroblastoma survive. Uh, so mercifully, I don't remember much of it. Uh, my, that is merciful. My parents obviously were in the thick of it, but uh, you know, once I became of an age where I could really understand just what I had escaped, Junior, I resolved that I would never waste a single second of a minute of an hour of a day of a month of a year. And I've really lived up to that. I was a valedictorian of my school, I was publicly elected to political office at the age of 19. I became the youngest deputy mayor in Australian history uh, just eight days after my 21st birthday in the Sydney area. I've written some best-selling books. I've spoken in 40 of the 50 states. I'm recognized worldwide as an authority on American exceptionalism. But that whole dynamic of wanting to achieve and being passionate and being strident in my views and taking every risk and hunting down every opportunity is not really in sync with the Australian culture. Mm. Australia is a lovely place, uh, but while it might sound a little harsh, I think the culture tends to strive for mediocrity as opposed to greatness. And it's a culture that prizes timidity and moderation and conformity and going along to get along. And none of those things really kind of match me. I've always been very much an unabashed individual and I like doing things my way and I like blazing a trail and leaving a legacy and doing things that no one's done before, charted uh, territory that is unknown. Uh, and again, the climate was not terribly conducive to that. And so when I was 24 years of age, I came to the United States of America for the first time, actually 10 years ago next month, June 2009 was the first time I came and I was absolutely blown away by how I was received in the United States of America, how I was treated and what I was able to accomplish. And it made me realize, Junior, that I was really an American trapped inside <laughs> an Australian body. Yeah. And uh, this place was much more my kind of place. And the people here were much more my kind of people. They, they were nicer people, they were more supportive people, and mm. it, was such a, it was such a refreshingly different atmosphere to be in a room where you could feel that almost everyone in that room, if not everybody, was rooting for your success. Where I was accustomed to addressing a room in Australia where I knew almost for certain that the overwhelming majority of people in that room 
were secretly hoping that I wouldn't be successful. Not good. Not good. Not good at all. So going back to this, what part of your personality made you, um, what am I say, appealing enough in that, that culture to become deputy mayor? It's a very good question. Look, I guess uh, I was very young and uh, at the, I had just started uh, university in my first year and I was recruited by some of the conservatives on campus to join the club and I really got kind of involved more for social reasons at the beginning. I was uh, kind of been given the advice by, by my parents and by people um, at, from high school that when you get to university that's where you can really discover who you are and you can find out what you like. And I was really blessed to go to the best school in uh, Australia, the University of Sydney, which had at the time, and there may be even more now, but at the time, uh, over uh, 500 clubs, <laughs> social clubs from which yeah. to choose from. And so I joined that club, I think for the measly sum of five dollars, oh. Yeah. And uh, that entitled me to go to, you know, events and, and uh, meet people and hang out with politicians. And anyway, uh, I, I guess I became, uh, uh, some people thought that I might have some potential. And I was asked if I was interested in running and for local government. There was an election coming up. And so I decided that uh, if I was going to do it, I was going to do it properly. And I was... I asked whether or not I really had much of a chance of winning and I was told that look not really take this as a bit of a trial run earn some brownie points with the party yeah. exactly and uh, that's never really been the way that I do things junior so I went and knocked on every door three times <laughs> and uh, I got elected so I think it was my energy I think it was my passion uh, I think it was the fact that I was so determined and um, I was an articulate young man, I was an intelligent young man and I think that it was refreshing to see someone so young uh, endeavour to do something like that. But it did not take long once I started making a name for myself for all of that to very quickly change. Uh, In I, what way? Well, I was re-elected to uh, to office, um, I, I served eight and a half years. I served two full terms, uh, so I was able to leave politics on my own accord, which was very on my own terms, which was yes. very important to me. <laughs> right. um, but you know, the second time, the second election, even though I was so much more well known and I was no longer a nineteen-year-old novice, mm -hmm. I was a, a twenty-three or twenty-four-year-old person that had been deputy mayor, that, uh, that had runs on the board, uh, that election was extraordinarily difficult. Uh, I, you know, I only just scraped in, uh, even though I'd worked just as hard, if not harder, because I knew that the battle was going to be difficult. So, uh, you know, the media started giving me a hard time. Was it over policy? Does the deputy mayor have any line authority? No, Junior, it wasn't really a political thing. It's more of a, again, I think it's more of a, an envy thing. Uh, you know, Australia has what we call the tall poppy syndrome. Oh. <laughs> you may be familiar with yes. it. Yes. Uh, for your viewers that aren't, essentially a poppy is a flower. It grows to all different sizes. And farmers and ranchers like to come along and cut them all the size because it's a much more aesthetically pleasing thing. And it's the same analogy as crabs in a bucket. If you have four crabs in a bucket and one starts to ascend upwards on one side of the, of the bucket, the other three will team up to come and yank it down. And uh, that's kind of the, the analogy for what happens in the culture once one differentiates themselves hmm. uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be with genuine success. It's the perception of success. Of ambition. Of ambition, of this person doesn't do things like I do them, so who does he think he is? I've got to, you know, right. pull them back to earth. And whereas the difference I've discovered and what I love so much about this country and what I go around explaining to public school students every day is that over here, people are unbelievably supportive of what you want to do. They want to help. help you. 
They want you to achieve your dream. Yeah. Um, and and I, I can't tell you how much that means to me. I mean, I get emotional when I think about it because it is really, it is something so unique in among humanity to have people in, it's, and this is not the country I was born in, it's my adopted country, it's the one I chose to come to, but for people to have taken to me and, and allowed all of my dreams to materialize is just, is something that I will be eternally grateful for. And what do the, is the reaction of the students when they hear your story? They love it, uh, Junior. They love it. I, I seem I don't know whether it's the accent or what it is, but goodwill. But goodwill. But the but the students seem to really uh, really enjoy it. You know, I, I will go and share with them that the day that they were born in the United States of America <laughs> is the day they won the lottery of life. I'll explain to them that this is a culture that is set up for their success more so than anywhere else. Yeah. That this is the only country in the world where your first language or last name means absolutely nothing yeah. where you can color outside of the lines where failure isn't fatal i mean that's that's another really special thing i mean if you go bankrupt once in any other country you're done you're finished no bank will ever loan you money oh, really? your yeah. family will privately make fun of you your friends will make oh. fun of you uh, whereas here, Walt Disney ran out of money twice. I don't. Uh, you know, we Henry Ford ran out of money twice. Um, I don't think our president ever ran out of money, but he he certainly went bankrupt officially a couple of times. So I explained to them that Thomas Edison had a thousand cracks at the light bulb. Right. Abraham Lincoln lost his first twelve elections on the trot. Colonel Sanders had his recipe for fried chicken rejected a thousand and eight times before he was able to set up KFC. Yeah, no. P.T. Barnum's first two circuses were abject failures, yet he went on to become the greatest showman. So in the United States of America, there are unlimited opportunities. You can make as many mistakes and fall down as many times as you want, but if you've got grit, determination, tenacity, persistence, and just, you can't coach desire, but if you've got desire in America, anything is possible. What is your desire for? I'd really like to make a very significant contribution, Junior, to this being an American century. I love it. What does that mean to well, you? Well, there are, there are no guarantees right. uh, in life, but there is one guarantee, and that is that if this is not an American century, it will not be a free century. That's true. <laughs> and I think America has done so much for mankind. It is the dream that so many people like me that have never even set foot on American soil that gives them comfort and gives them hope and gives them something to, to live for. And I really want to spark a, a, a renaissance in the United States culturally. I want, to, I want people to believe in the American dream. I want Americans to feel comfortable about who they are. I want them to never apologize for being America. America, obviously, just like any human being, is, is imperfect, makes mistakes, is fallible. But on the balance, this is the greatest country in the history of the world. Without it, it's a world that we wouldn't want to live in. And I want to make sure that every child in this country has a heart beating for America because it really, really pains me to see so many young people today not realize yeah. what they have. <laughs> it's true. And not even have Failure a- Failure of the schools. E exactly. And not even have a basic understanding or appreciation for what it means to be an American of our constitution, of our declaration of independence, of our federalist papers. So I want to change all of that. And I think the real heart and soul for that change is in public schools. And At how early an age? Oh, very early, Junior, very early. I, I, I think from the moment they enter the gates of elementary yes. school. Yes, <laughs> I do too. I mean, at the moment, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that there is a, another cultural force on the other side of this yeah. that has the polar opposite ambitions for America. And they certainly begin their work the moment that a child enters the gates of their elementary and school. And also in time. books. In books, precisely. So we were the young. Yes, we are. We we created the world's first kid-friendly constitution, Declaration of Independence, and Federalist Papers. 
that's my organization flag uh, because we wanted to make sure I mean it's it's designed with graphics that are appealing illustrations that are appealing to a fifth grader or even a fourth grader and uh, it's in easy simple to understand English we want to really make sure that we are getting our children to believe in American values not European values not socialist values but traditional American values that have catapulted Junior the United States of America to the pinnacle nation on this earth. In freedom and technological breakthroughs and health breakthroughs. Absolutely. Yes, and creativity. Right. Socialism crumps, crimps, crushes. Everything. Everything. The soul. There are four ways that a nation is said to be exceptional. Culturally, militarily, economically and scientifically. And on each of those four measurements in almost 5,000 years of recorded human history with less than 5% of the world's population, America has dominated those four spheres to an extent previously considered impossible. Uh, unachievable. And none of that happened just by accident. That was all very deliberate. That was our founders, the most brilliant men, t who wanted to make sure that they could have a society that unleashed creativity, that, that drove human accomplishment. So how would you measure success for yourself personally inside? Well, look, I, I mean, I, I feel success every time I speak to a student after I have given a school presentation and they come up to me and they say, Mr. Adams, that was really interesting. You made me feel really good about my country and my life and my prospects. and and I'd never really heard that before. I love going junior into at-risk school, or oh, yeah. at schools where st the majority of students are at risk, uh, or Title I schools where most of the, the children live on um, food vouchers, yeah. uh, because it's there where they need the most hope. And going in there and explaining that in the United States of America, nobody is going to get in your face and tell you that you can't do it. Uh, you know, I'll give That's you... That's true. Victimhood I'll, is not a good idea. Exactly. I mean, I'll give you just a really quick example. Uh, Junior, when I first came to the United States of America to live here permanently and I started FLAG, FLAG was out of a garage. Tell me. Just like, you know, some of the American greats. It was out of a garage. And I've got to be honest with you, I kind of lived in fear coming from Australia where operating a business in your garage is illegal. Oh, really? And, uh, and your neighbours will more than likely report, report you. you to the local authorities. And I would always think, oh, I'm sure someone's going to come and knock on my door one day. I'm sure someone's going to... And it was the most amazing thing for me to have the, the garage door wide open, have people lots help. of people going back and forth, never one complaint in the two years that I lived in this tiny apartment with a huge garage. Fantastic. That's America. People are more interested in achieving their own American dreams. They don't want to tear down other people. So how big themselves. a job is this, would you say? It's a massive job. We need to be all in for it. And over a generation? Longer? It's certainly a long-term thing. I mean, I think we can, we can certainly have short-term results, but uh, it's going to take a long time, Junior. The, the opposition have been at it for, I think, the last 60 years. Yes. Uh, they are far more strategic than we are. And I think that there's a passion gap too. I think it's fair to say that the left in this country have wanted to destroy America in the last 60 years more than we have wanted to protect it. And at the end of the day, this is very similar to a street fight. It's going to come down to who wants it the most. And until we can match them in intensity, until we can match them in strategy, uh, I think that we are in a lot of trouble. Uh, but I, as a lifelong student of American history, uh, remain uns unswervingly convinced that our best days still lie ahead. So what, what, uh, what kind of colleagues do you um, affiliate with? Who's helping? Well, we have a, a great staff of uh, six that work, a lot. that work every day. We're, we're an exponentially growing organization, Junior. We are, are really having an unheralded impact. I think that a lot of people had kind of given up 
on tradition in public schools and I saw a hole in the market and I kind of drove a big American truck through it. Yeah, good and, for you. And so we're achieving great things. Uh, our national education program is um, spearheaded by my beautiful wife. Oh, uh, good. A, a former high school teacher until she got married to me and moved to Texas and, you know. And, I like that. Yes. An, an insider. An insider, absolutely. And, uh, and then we have a host of other really talented people that work every day to get our resources into schools that work uh, on lining up and coordinating classroom visits and that also uh, are getting teachers trained up to know how to teach civics. And what, know, did, what did you have to learn to be good at this? Well, look, I think running an organization, much like running a business, you really need to have a lot of different skills. You need to have leadership skills, you need to have management skills, you need to have organizational skills. You need to know when to delegate and when to not. You need to know um, what your staff are capable of and how hard you should push them and engender loyalty. And, and you know, I, I was uh, very lucky. I mean, I, I, my, my parents sent me uh, to a private all-boys school um, in Sydney, one of the elite schools. And I, it was a tough school. It was a tough school, not, not, not academically, but it was a tough school for the rigors, the, the rigors oh. that they personally would put you through. Uh, you know, you couldn't have your shirt rolled up. If you had your shirt rolled up, it had to be up above your elbow. Uh, your shoes had to be polished. If you walked into school at eight o'clock in the morning with a five o'clock shadow, you were handed a razor. <laughs> uh, you had to wear your jacket, your blazer. You had right. to wear a boater uh, if you're off the school grounds, no matter what the weather was. Uh, and that kind of, you know, looking back, a lot of that seems rather archaic now. But what that really did was it taught me that the small things matter. And it taught me that... Uh, Good habits. Yes. And you need to be, um, you really need to have attention to detail to um, really have great success. But I think more than anything, Junior, if I've learned anything, it's perseverance. It's getting up when you fall down. You didn't have yes. that in Australia? Well, I, I mean, yeah, I did. I mean, that kind of trained right. me. I mean, I had lots of disappointments and betrayals and, and, uh, and things like that. And then I came to the United States of America. And so now when there are disappointments or letdowns, because I had the experience. <laughs> it just takes a little experience. Yeah. And it's much easier to, to get up in this environment than it was in, in Australia. So, uh, but I think that that's the number one tenacity is, is the number one value, I think, for successful people. How would you teach that? Well, it's very difficult to teach, very difficult to teach. I mean, if somebody is not born with that desire, if, if someone, uh, doesn't want to be that good, uh, that's, that's difficult. Um, I think that a lot of it would come down to parenting, it would come down to, to education. And I think, like, I, like the stories I share of, of the anecdotes I share with students of real Americans that have had a, an unbelievable impact and who are still in the national conversation sometimes two centuries after their death, uh, because of their tenacity, uh, I think that's the way of getting young people to understand that uh, taking a risk, I mean, taking a risk, Junior, is the most American thing you can do. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Every and also the belief that you have a shot of having it work out. Correct, correct. So that it's worth an attempt. Worth an attempt, precisely. But I mean, every other society tends to be risk averse. Whereas in America, you know, I, I went once and I spoke to a, uh, a group of young entrepreneurs. And the first thing they did when they started their meeting was they all got up and they had to announce how many successful ventures <laughs> they had had compared to how many they hadn't. So, you know, one guy would get up and he'd say, I'm two from 
13. And another guy would get up and say, I'm one from nine. And another guy would get up and say, I'm three from 45. Yeah. And uh, now, again, I mean, the cultural difference. Uh, you, when they would say, I'm, I'm three from 45, I mean, yeah! I mean, it was, well done, fantastic, that's amazing, that's great. Whereas I think the average Australian would say, this guy failed 45 times. He's a pretty average businessman. <laughs> So, I mean, the, the whole way of looking at things is totally different. Thank you. So we've learned uh, quite a bit from Nick, and that is, first of all, find the culture that works best for you in the aggregate. And two, recognize who you are. Some people have a lot of energy, which he does, and a lot of drive, which he does, and a lot of ambition, which he does, and a lot of gratitude, which he does. And he is unfazed um, by resistance. And that is very thing, very um, valuable. But it's also valuable to be able to weave and parry and continue, as in his second run for deputy mayor. There is not a place in the world that, I, I mean in America, that you cannot probably figure out the next step. The next step is always the, the thing that gets you up off the ground. Never be a victim always see the opportunity. This man <laughs> does, and he's got the gift of gab, so you know you don't have a chance to counter. But that's good too, because the warmth of him comes out and the belief comes out. So as you go about your life, lift people up, see the good and gratitude about being an American. And remember, go out and do something kind for someone you know and someone you don't know, and do it every day till I see you next time. And thank you for tuning in. And thank you, Nick. Thank you, Junia. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonesthespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones The Spark. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.